Please welcome to the stage Chicago Council on Global Affairs President Evo Dalda. Welcome to all here in, in Chicago and all around the world when you, if you are joining us via live stream to the 2018 Chicago Forum on Global Cities. I'm Evo Dalda, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and we're so pleased once again to co-host this year's forum with the Financial Times. Jillian Tetz, to you and your team, thank you for your partnership. When we started this initiative four years ago, we knew there was a need to address the role of cities, especially global cities, to, and, what they, and how they play uh, a role in, in a rapidly changing world. In this urban century, cities are drivers of innovation and economic growth, of social experimentation, of political mobilization, and indeed of so much more. And the forum is where we gather each year for an in-depth discussion of the cutting edge issues facing our cities and our world. One of the issues of a special prominence this year is the big battle of ideas being waged in cities around the globe the battle between liberalism and authoritarianism. While the stakes remain national, urban areas have become the main arenas where our govern governance will be decided. The history of liberalism is, after all, the history of the city. Since at least the Dutch Golden Age, cities have been the locus of liberalism and individualism. Urban centers have experimented with new political and economic freedoms and liberties. From globalization to gay rights, most of the major transformations in our world began as urban novelties. And what worked in cities soon spread beyond them. An urbanizing world, history suggests, ought then to be a liberalizing world. But this history may now be ending. China, Russia, and their emulators are seeking to impose strict authoritarian constraints that pick and choose which urban and liberal features to allow, where, and when. The appeal of authoritarian leaders is clear. Keeping cities under control quells opposition, both the local and national governments. But the resulting stability may in fact be elusive. While most decisions are made by a very few at the very top, the rest stew in resentment of and or succumb to apathy with all the attendant damage to economic output, to health, to civic cohesion. Nor are the key problems facing modern cities, security, climate change, pollution, sustainable growth, inequality, addressed in these cities in anything other than through a piecemeal stopgap fashion. But that's not how real cities work elsewhere around the world, and even occasionally in Russia and China, in the face of opposition, cities have addressed those problems like they always have, through unconstrained experimentation and the development of best practices. Now, cities should start to be put at the center of not just our urban policies, but our national policies. So far, the US and other governments have seen urban policy be to be an irrelevant to nation-to-nation -to -nation diplomacy. But the political moments now demand otherwise. Over the next 30 years, billions of people will move to cities, driving the development and the future of countries all over the globe, especially in Africa and South Asia. What happens there will drive the future, including the prospect of liberal democracy around the globe. The United States and others will do well to start prioritizing urban policy as central to their foreign policies. Let's start by having the State Department and the European Commission work to promote urban planners, smart cities technology, sustainable buildings and power generation, and advanced mobility and transportation platforms to the growing urban centers of the world. More stakeholders making better decisions in urban areas across the world would let cities continue to be the incubators of prosperity and liberal values, and we will all stand to gain. Cities are problem solvers, and that is the focus of our discussion over the next three days. I look forward to learning more from all of you as we put cities first. Come to think of it, that has a nice ring to it. Putting 
cities first. Before I hand over the podium to Gillian Tett for her welcome, I would like to thank all of those who have made this forum possible. And let me start with the most important people, our sponsors, and thank them all for their incredible support. Advi, UL, Grant Thornton, Hyde Hotels Foundation, Kirkland and Ellis, United Airlines, USG, and the foundation support from the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you, too, to the mayors and the staffs around the world for taking time to share your stories. This mor morning, along with Mayor Emanuel, we discussed challenges related to inclusive growth and heard solutions from Amsterdam, Bristol, Zurich, Osaka, Hamburg, Bangkok, Austin, to name but a few of the mayors who were with us. The dialogue was fruitful and one step towards making our cities more inclusive for all of our inhabitants. Thank you also to our international partners, from ACI in Medellin, to the Center for Livable Cities in Singapore, and from Guangzhou Institute of Urban Innovation, to Kairi in Buenos Aires. These and other centers of excellence from every corner of the world are at the forefront, working on ideas that we will hear about and workshop here in Chicago. I'd also like to thank our many non-resident fellows who have come from all over the globe. Their work is adding greater depth and greater breadth to the Council's research on cutting-edge urban topics. Thank you to our wonderful local partners, as well, who have opened their doors and their playbooks to all the visitors from met met metropolises near and far. And consist consistent with the mission of the Council, we want to thank and hear from our youth. Please welcome our student delegation here on the stage with me. Uh, there are 29 students from 29 universities in 22 countries, and they have flown in from Beirut, Hong Kong, Sydney, Cairo, Tel Aviv, Istanbul, and Nairobi. The young come with bold ideas about the cities that are, after all, their future. Don't worry, though, we're more than happy to hear ideas from the not so young as well. The Chicago Board Council was born out of a simple conviction, conviction. Cities are actors, bold actors. And, what is, uh, and that is why tonight, I would also want to thank you, our global citizens, who are also local residents, who want to share in this important and dynamic exchange over the next three days. Thank you, and now it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Gillian Tett of the Financial Times, our co-host of the evening. Gillian. Well, thank you very much indeed for that fabulous welcome. And on behalf of the FT, I'd like to echo that very strongly. It's actually the fourth year that we have partnered, and it's been a fabulous conference. It gets better each year, and I'm really looking forward to the debate in the next few days. Now, I was in Washington the last couple of days talking to people about politics, and when I stopped talking to people about the latest dramas around the White House and Donald Trump, and there were a lot of dramas to talk about. We talked a bit about the future of the Democrat Party and who might be the next leader. And a comment I heard several times was, well, maybe we should be looking to a mayor. The reason is that cities, in many ways, provide many of the good news stories in America. They are the place, as you just heard, of great innovation great creativity, huge economic growth, great dynamism, great experimentation, and above all else, as Eva's just said, a lot of problem solving, and a lot of bipartisan, pragmatic, creative, let's think outside the box, but collaborate and learn from each other types of problem solving. Not always the case, Cities are also a place of great inequality, environmental problems, gridlock. We all know about that. I came from the airport this afternoon. Also a place of great environmental challenges. But cities truly are some of the most fascinating sites of stories today, not just in America, but right across the world. And we're here at the FT because we love great stories. We love stories about innovation, 
economic energy, entrepreneurial activity, and problem solving. So, in that light, we have a supplement in, this, in today's FT, all about cities, time to go with the conference. If you haven't read it yet, please do. It's got a lot of fabulously inspiring stories. Even better, we have a special offer, I have to say that, for subscription to the FT. So if any of you don't yet read the FT, I'm sure we can help you to persuade you. We also have a number of fabulous FT journalists here. Andrew Edgecliffe Johnson, Ed Luce, Jamil Andalini, Ed Crooks, Patty Waldmeyer. They're taking part, they'll be wandering around, so do grab them, talk to them, give them, them some great story ideas. Tell them what you don't like about the FT, what you'd like us to do better. We want to listen. And last but not least, we're very interested in taking part in these debates. When I first came to America about 10 years ago, or first visited, people would sometimes say to me, well, you're the Financial Times of London. Not strictly true. London's a great city. In fact, something you may not know is that these days, 30% of our audience is in America. It's actually our biggest single web audience. And we're seeing triple-digit um, triple advertising growth in the digital side and 60% print advertising growth compared to this time last year. So America matters a lot to us. But above all else, it's not just America that matters to us. It's a cross-border stories. The stories about how cities are collaborating with each other to foster unusual links. So I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days of debate. I'm really looking forward to being inspired by all the stories that are coming out. And I'd just like to say once again, thank you all for making the journey here to take part in this fascinating exchange of ideas. And I look forward very much to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you. Please welcome Caroline Daniel, partner Brunswick Group, and former mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in Chicago again, where I was a uh, reporter for the Financial Times as the Chicago correspondent. It's also a great pleasure to actually have Michael Nutter <laughs> literally on the couch. So I'm going to have to ask uh -oh. my most deep and insightful questions for him. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start by uh, directly into the deep end. In your time as mayor, you're in the forefront of the battle over sanctuary cities mm -hmm. um, with an executive order to establish Philadelphia's status as a sanctuary city back in 2014. But did you ever imagine it would lead to this enormous political battle with Donald Trump that we're seeing right now? <laughs> Well, in 2014, I could never have imagined that Donald Trump would be president. So, uh, no, I, I didn't see that one coming. Um, but uh, the good news is uh, just today, uh, a federal judge ruled that, that uh, Philadelphia was right and that the federal government and the Trump administration is wrong and they can't withhold federal funding uh, from Philadelphia and our status has been affirmed. Does that mean it's job done, this issue's going to go away, we've won? With this administration, I would doubt it. <laughs> I, I, I almost assume that they will continue to battle on or take some other tactic uh, to try to drive home the point that they want to force uh, cities to uh, heal uh, to the will of uh, the, um, the dictator. But who's the dictator in this case? That would be Mr. Trump. Um, talking of Mr. Trump, you, you have also warned about there being a level of antagonism and conflict growing between cities and the federal government. Mm. And you've warned that we're going to see more strong, strident, and aggressive leadership by mayors, both Democrats and Republicans, pushing back on the ideas that could be devastating for America. Can you sort of unpack where we're going to see some of these fault lines coming? Well, um, we heard any number of mayors basically reject uh, the president's announcement that uh, the United States would pull out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, there's virtually no mayor in the United States of America uh, that's paying any attention uh, to that because we know that climate change is real, we're not deniers, we're realists, and we know that we have to take action uh, in our cities. That will 
be a looming fight. Uh, we talked about sanctuary cities, but also immigration, uh, immigration yeah. policy. It would be nice if the United States of America actually had uh, an immigration policy for the entire country, uh, but you'll increasingly see mayors taking action in that regard. People come to us, we're gonna provide service because they're in our communities, and we actually want to be a more immigrant-friendly uh, city, many of our cities across the United States. So just two areas, public safety, uh, major issues uh, in the country uh, as it relates to city, national uh, politics. And, and in your time as mayor of Philadelphia, you managed to um, successfully target wooing immigrants to the city in order mm -hmm. to address population decline. Yeah. Can you give me a specific example of what worked for you? A couple of things. Uh, I signed an executive order early on that required the city uh, to publish. Uh, anything that we published had to be in at least 12 languages. Uh, I signed another executive order requiring that uh, no city agency could ever ask uh, a person about their documentation or their documented uh, status and that we were required to provide service to anyone uh, who was a resident of the city of Philadelphia regardless of their immigration status. So what didn't work? in terms of attracting immigrants and some of the battles you had around this as an issue as a mayor? Um, well, I think this continued fight uh, with regard to um, whether or not cities have to cooperate uh, with ICE uh, continues to be a challenge uh, for many cities. Uh, I think that uh, longer term, uh, policies that uh, are in fact welcoming, uh, that mayors are taking strong stands to welcome uh, people to our cities, and that we make uh, cities that much more attractive uh, to immigrant communities. I think there's a serious amount of confusion uh, in many immigrant populations as to is the United States an immigrant-friendly city, uh, country rather, uh, when daily uh, different constituencies are being attacked. And so there's a fair amount of confusion, I think, in the marketplace as to is America welcoming or not. Um, going back to your time as mayor, you, uh, you gave a speech when you uh, started as mayor and a lot of people have cited it, and one of the lines you had on it was, I didn't run for mayor to be a caretaker of the status quo. And you went on to say, we can choose to try new ideas and new approaches. We can choose to make a shared commitment to return the city to one of the greatest cities in the United States. Do you think you were as transformative as you wish you'd been? I think there was always more uh, to be done. Um, unlike uh, Chicago, Philadelphia has term limits, uh, two terms, two four-year terms, and then you know, thank you for your service and, you know, have a nice life. Uh, I'm not wondering so, why the audience is laughing at this point, but... Because uh, we're in Chicago, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which does not have term limits. Uh, good luck, Mayor No, I, needed, I just needed you to spell that out for me. Yeah, I know. Um, so uh, I wanted um, greater uh, reductions in crime. I wanted greater increases in high school uh, graduation, more college degree attainment. I wanted more jobs. I wanted even more... Uh, population growth. And so uh, I think that this is the kind of work, uh, the work is really never done. There's always more uh, to do, but you should set goals. I wanted to be the number one green city in America, inspired by uh, prior mayor, uh, Mayor Daley, uh, and much of the work done uh, here in Chicago. And I think Philadelphia attained a certain status uh, in the country and the world uh, in that regard. So mayors borrow, borrow uh, ideas uh, from each other all the time. Uh, for our own agendas uh, back home. And what's your advice to Ram at the moment? Um, that I don't give mayors advice in public, um, <laughs> and that I wish him very well uh, in the election next year. And um, one of the things I also read about you is, um, um, it was in fact, it was an article in the city paper in Philadelphia when you were first in office called, the title was Hail to the Nerd. <laughs> um, and it mentioned that you, you did a lot of homework and that you also read every document. Um, but also ask the question about whether that's being too much of a micromanager as a mayor. I wonder if you can reflect on that about the role of being a mayor. Yeah, I, um, I think a lot of that was a little bit of carryover from my time in city council, where I really did read every document. Um, it is impossible to read every document as mayor, uh, but I thought it important uh, as mayor of the fifth largest city in the United States of America to at least be well informed uh, on certain things. And for things I really cared about, I wanted to be uh, knowledgeable. Uh, I was blessed with a tremendous team uh, and gave them uh, full reign uh, to run their departments and agencies, and I was the beneficiary of much of their work. And you said being a mayor is the best job in America. Yeah. Can you, can you just give me a sort of flavor of why? Well, you can get stuff done. You can make things happen. You can see 
the impact of your work uh, in real time. Uh, whether it's, you know, I mean, the day to day picking up trash, filling potholes, but, you know, I had a 31% reduction in homicides during my eight year span. There are people alive in Philadelphia uh, because of the work that we do. Um, there are young people who graduated from high school, they went on to college. There are public employees in our returning to learning program uh, who went back to school uh, because I tried to heavily emphasize and, and created programs to encourage folks who had maybe some college but didn't finish to go back to school. Um, you know, you can see it in the, you know, where upon summer, you know, you go to rec centers, you go to libraries, you see young people thriving and growing. Uh, and so it's, uh, being mayor is a very personal job. It's day to day. Uh, it's hard to believe, but I go to the barber shop. Uh, you have conversations with people about, you know, things that they really care about. You go to the supermarket and folks catch you in the aisle and, you know, want to have discussions. It's a very hands-on, day to day, real job. You can get stuff done. We used to talk about GSD, but we're in a public forum, so we made, made it stuff uh, instead of something else. So I know we're about, about, about to be out of time, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. but I wonder if, if, this, if being a mayor is the best job in America politically, what is the yeah. worst job in America politically? Yeah, I think at the moment it's got to be a, being a member of the House of Representatives. Um, yeah, and, and I'm glad there are people there and I've got really good friends uh, in the Congress, but you know, I mean, I would probably just, I, I'd probably slit my throat if I was a <laughs> member of Congress. Uh, you know, I mean, what do you do? What are you in charge of? What are you making happen? What, I mean, you know, I've got the amendment to the Article 3 of the subpart of the section and, you know, uh, widows will get puppies when they turn 75 or something like that. I mean, I just couldn't deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're not running to, you're not going to run as a politician in Washington then? No. Um, I'm going to help other people get elected. I, I won't run for another office. Um, I, and I think there comes a point, uh, I, I try to tell my political friends, you know, we're not supposed to die in these jobs. Um, do your time, perform your service, and basically get off the stage and get out of the way and let younger people uh, run for office and give them an opportunity. And, <laughs> unfortunately, just gave, gave me my fantastic exit line, when unfortunately we do have to get off the stage. Yeah. Can you join me in thanking Mayor Nutter? <laughs> Please welcome Mariella Shaker, violinist and UNHCR high profile supporter. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to be here with you today. I was one of these young people in Syria whom their dreams were vanished in the war. While I was in Aleppo, I was running under bombs and rockets falling to internet cafes due to the huge lack of electricity and power in my home. I was determined to send my application to different programs and universities all over the world. After six months of tireless work, I was beyond happy to receive an email from Monmouth College in Illinois offering me a full tuition scholarship in music performance. It's now four years later, and although I feel safe here, I live in a constant fear about my family and friends who are still struggling and surviving without the basic necessities of life. Being a refugee in the US taught me a lot to be strong, independent, and among all to never give up. I graduated from Monmouth College and I received another full tuition scholarship for the Master of Music program at DePaul University and I finished last June. Unable to return back home, I was granted asylum and I recently received my green card. I was humbled to be honored at the White House as champion of change for world refugees by President Obama. Today, I consider myself as not just a Syrian citizen, 
but also new loyal and devoted young American women. Refugees have always been an integral part of the fabric of this country. I'm so proud to be a high-profile supporter for the UN Refugee Agency. My role is to show people that refugees are normal people who have dreams and ambitions. They are not a burden, but displaced people who are eager to find a second chance and opportunity. I would like to thank the United States and all Americans for the compassion and support they have always shown toward refugees and to me when I first arrived in Illinois. I feel powerless to change the current tragedy ongoing in my country. However, I believe so much in the power of music to remove barriers between people and nations. Music is the bridge which has saved my life and helped opening fascinating doors for the flourish of my career. Because when you lose your home, music is all what left to tell the story of that suffering country and people. I would like to perform one of my favorite pieces of music, Meditation from Thais by Massinet. I hope Music will one day help healing the pain our world has felt and create peace platform for everyone. Thank you.
please welcome Charles Bowman, the Lord Mayor of the City of London. Well, City of Chicago, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, so much for the very kind invitation to join you all this evening uh, for the Global Cities Forum. And may I say, it is a real, real pleasure to be back in Chicago. Whenever I return to the States, I'm always reminded of my post-high school, pre-university travels to this great country. Somewhat strapped for cash as a young student, I part-funded that trip by drawing pictures of our great city of London's impressive architecture and landscape, and by selling my artwork to the very kind but rather unsuspecting Americans I met along my travels. So if you ever find a very, and I underline very, amateur painting of London Bridge or St Paul's Cathedral in a neighbour's house, you know who's the culprit. <laughs> but this evening I am delighted, really delighted to join you in my role as the 690th Lord Mayor of our great city of London. In that, that role, I act as a spokesperson and a key ambassador for the UK's preeminent financial and professional services centre. It is a city and a centre that plays a crucial part in the global economic ecosystem, housing more foreign banks than any other financial hub, trading on average $2.4 trillion in foreign exchange every day and exporting some $110 billion worth of financial services worldwide every year. Our financial services sector in the city is, as I often say, a national, European, and importantly, a global jewel. Behind that global jewel is something even more important and more unique to the city of London. Paramount to London's success is what we call our creative energy found in every place, in every person, and in every profession in our city. And this creative energy is underpinned by a number of fundamental foundations. Our rule of law, culture, history, access to talent, diversity, education, taxation, regulation, innovation, infrastructure, time zone, language, security, probity, and a great place to live and work. And with over 1,000 years of history, these foundations are difficult to replicate elsewhere. If they could, they would, but hitherto they haven't, and so long as we are not complacent, they won't. I mention probity in that list because there is one ingredient that in creating a better city for all matters perhaps above all else, and that is trust, the theme of my Merrill year, and the subject I want to major on tonight because it really, really does matter above all else. Since the 2008 financial crisis, public trust in business and institution all across the world remain at an all-time low. With many citizens feeling that the social and economic bruises still affect them 10 years after the financial crisis. Bearing this out are the 2017 and 2018 Edelman Trust Barometers, which show a huge drop-off in public trust in institutions, not just in business, but in the institutions of government, media, and NGOs. And the tragedy of this pandemic of distrust is that we all rely on the services that these institutions provide. 
and we all have a stake in their success and their trustworthiness. So the message that I am repeating continuously during my Merrill year is this. For London to remain the global hub for financial and professional services, then at a national level, the UK has a responsibility to be constantly investing in the trust of the society that we are there to serve. And that internationally, we must demonstrate that London continues to invest in being the trusted cluster of choice. The potential gains of rebuilding public trust are huge. Behavioral insights researchers say that social trust is one of the most important and underappreciated economic indicators that we possess. And this is backed up by anecdotal evidence from CEOs who say that when trust in their firms improve, so too do their results. Trust is the lifeblood of any and all organizations. The single biggest determinant of success, success measured in wealth created, jobs generated, and prosperity spread. But how do we create such public trust? This question has been at the heart of my own Business of Trust program, a program designed to help bring greater public trust and greater public prosperity to London, to the UK, and indeed the world. The Business of Trust program began with a year of intense research. My team in London started with a business review, reviewing the many thousands of man years of activity that professional bodies, businesses, and institutions have put into professional standards, codes of conduct, and ethics. At the same time, we collected public feedback, speaking to what we called citizens' juries. These gathered members of the public for debate and discussion on the theme of trustworthiness in cities up and down the UK. Each was broadly representative of the British population in terms of age and gender and background. We then condensed the business review and the public feedback down to their key points. And this allowed us to draw comparisons between the two. And we were very pleased, very pleased to find that they reconciled with one another with very, very little amendment bar language. And from there, we were able to create five civic guiding principles for building trust. <coughs> Competence and skill. In short, business must do what they do well. Integrity. Business must do the right thing. Value to society. Business must have a wider purpose. Interests of others. Business must focus on the customer and other stakeholders. And clear communication. Business must communi communicate transparently and clearly. These principles and the research behind them can indeed be found in the Business of Trust publication access via my own Twitter page, which is at City Lord Mayor. And over the last six months, I've been using my role as Lord Mayor of the City of London to promote this trust agenda, highlighting our research and encouraging organizations to engage with and adopt the business of trust principles. And I'm pleased to say that the program has been met with huge enthusiasm, both home and abroad. And the early results show that 95% of people we've spoken to believe that the civic principles can help to develop trustworthiness. But the principles of business of trust need not be solely confined to business. The programme has been res resonating with a much wider audience in the UK, from schoolchildren to sports people. So much so, in fact, 
that we began a series of video interviews on the issues raised. And so far, our interviews have included business leaders, several politicians, senior clergymen, the governor of the Bank of England, and sports stars in both New Zealand and in Australia. But I also, also want to hear from you, our international thought leaders, due to the globalised nature of our largest institutions. The issue of trust spans far and wide. And therefore, I would greatly welcome your view in the business of trust conversation. And to contribute, please head again to my Twitter page at City Lord Mayor, if you didn't hear it the first time, where you will find a pinned tweet to my business of trust survey. And thank you perhaps in advance for that support. We are continuing, continuing to, get, to gain great insights from the Business of Trust program, constantly adapting our approach depending on what we learn. And perhaps before I finish, let me share with you five key findings to date. Firstly, leadership models. Public expectations of leaders and leadership hierarchy are changing. And if we want to improve trust in institutions, it is crucial that we empower the next generation of leaders. Which is why, two, education lies at the heart of the Business of Trust program. From the classroom to the boardroom, trust must be a topic which is discussed openly and honestly. Thirdly, technology. Technology must be looked at as a tool to facilitate rather than to undermine trust. It provides an accessible platform for providing our stakeholders with a clear communications channel. And as one wise fintech CEO said to me recently, this fourth revolution that we live in today is both a technology and a values revolution. The two are intrinsically linked. Fourthly, social purpose. Business must do a better job to define, communicate, and explain its social purpose. And this is particularly relevant to our sector and to our great city, where we are encouraging businesses both individually and collectively to communicate that social purpose. And our own City Giving Day, engaging all employees of the City of London, happening on the 25th of September, is one such in initiative supporting that collective engagement. And fifthly, and arguably most importantly, personal responsibility. And time and time again, this is proven to be the crux of the trust issue. And I'm pleased to say that through my many interactions with people from all walks of society, that penny is finally beginning to drop. Rebuilding public trust is by no means an easy task. Trust is hard to win and easy to lose. It arrives on foot and it leaves on a galloping horse. But re-earning public trust in institutions is essential for the stability of our society. Without trust, a feeling of discontent, of uneasiness, of fear can gather, which can overflow into protest, disruption, and public manifestation. And as we've seen, can risk an irreparable outbreak of public discontent. As decision makers and as thought leaders, it is therefore up to us to ensure that public trust is a key objective in all the work that we do. From leading our organizations, to managing our teams, to our individual conduct around our workplaces and much wider and beyond. Step by step, we have a duty to develop trustworthiness and public trust and constantly build and fortify the bridge between society's citizens and its leaders. 
giving us the confidence and public faith to bring prosperity, social cohesion, security, peace, and creating better cities for us all. Thank you very much. Please welcome poet and author, Emily Jungmin Yoon. Hello. Is this working? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be here and share my poem with all of you. And before I read my poem, I'd just like to share a few words about my history with poetry. So when I was 10, I didn't speak English very well, and I was teased a lot for my uh, mispronunciations and misuse of many words. And I was anxious about my ability to communicate with myself. Um, but looking back, I think that anxiety actually launched me into a very productive struggle with questions of identity and its relationship to language, the relationship between language and national belonging. So I fell in love with poetry because poetry is a space where grammar, its rules are destroyed and the borders between languages are also pushed. They're not only pushed, but celebrated. And I could experiment and embrace my language. So I think that poetry built on empathy lets you know that you are never alone in the art, that even though a poem is born out of a very particular situation, in its powerful uh, acrobatics of language, it lets other people know that there is community out there, that you feel this too. So I'd like to share my poem, Bell Theory, which is born out of these reminiscent meditations. Bell Theory. When I was laughed at for my clumsy English, I touched my throat, which said ear when my ear said year, and year after year I pronounced a new thing wrong and other throats laughed. Elevator, library, vibrating bells in their mouths. How to say azalea, how to say forsythia, say instead golden bells, Say, I'm in ESL. In French class, a boy whose last name is Kring called me Belle, called me by my Korean name, pronouncing it wrong, called it loudly, called attention to my alien. I touched the globe moving in my throat, a hemisphere sinking, called me across the field lined with golden bells. I wanted to run and be loved at the same time by Kring, as in ring of people. Where are you going? We're laughing with you. The bell in our throat that rings with laughter is called uvula, from uva, grape. A theory, special to our species, this grape bell has to do with speech, which separates us from animals. Kring looked at me and said, just curious, do you eat dogs? and I wanted to end my small life, be reborn a golden retriever of, of North America, lie on a field lined with golden bells, loved. Today, in a country where dogs are more cherished than a foreign child, an Oregon Senate candidate says no to refugees. Says, years ago, Vietnamese refugees ate dogs, harvested other people's pets, harvest as in harvest grapes, harvest, as in harvest a field of golden rice, as do people from rice countries, as in people eat dog worlds. Years ago, 1923, Japan, the phrase jugoen gojitsen is used to set apart Koreans, say 15 yen, 50 sen. The colonized who used the chaos of the Kanto earthquake to poison waters set fire, a cruelty special to our species, a cruelty special to our species. 
how to say jugo, how to say gojit, how jugo sounds like die in Korean, how gojit sounds like lie, 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 library, azalea, library. I'm going to the library. I lied years ago on a field lined with forsythia. Thank you. Please welcome your moderator, Edward Luce, and panelists for Minding the Gap. Good evening. Um, great pleasure to be here. It's fourth year, as Ivo and, and Gillian said earlier, it's my fourth year. And every year I am reminded about what a fantastic city Chicago is, apart from anything else. Um, and I think um, Ivo and the Council, Chicago Council on Global Affairs, have done a brilliant job of putting Chicago on the map, and the Council in particular as this being the venue for this rising topic of rising global cities. So congratulations um, to them. You'll be pleased to hear that uh, for the next 50 minutes or so, we're not gonna mention Donald Trump. And uh, as a journalist <laughs> based in Washington, um, this is a very refreshing contrast um, to talk about something meaty and substantive and cross-border. Those of you, which I imagine is most of you or many of you that have traveled on the London Underground will be familiar with that robotic voice. Please mind the gap. Mind the gap. Stand clear of the doors, please. And Minding the Gap is the title of uh, what we're going to be discussing um, this evening. And really, in terms of the urban uh, gap, th there's two that I'd like to talk about. The first is between cities and everywhere else. So nobody can have covered or followed politics in the West in the last few years without noticing this great political divergence between the city um, and the hinterlands, or much of the electorates in the hinterlands of the nation states that the cities are in. And that's making it very, very hard. Marvin, who's from Bristol, the mayor of Bristol, knows that cities were vetoed, essentially, um, by the rest of the British electorate in the Brexit referendum. We have a similar story here with the election of he who shall not be named. Um, <laughs> so that's one gap. It's really a political gap between these economically vibrant cities and the rest. Um, the other is within cities, the, the inequality gap, um, which I, I think we're going to focus on first. And we've got a brilliant panel um, to do that with. Marvin uh, Rees, as I mentioned, is mayor of Bristol, uh, one of Britain's uh, most vibrant second-tier cities. I think it's fair to call you second-tier. Everywhere that isn't London <laughs> is second-tier. I'll, I'll let you get away with that at the start. <laughs> and, and I believe the first um, black um, Afro-Caribbean mayor of any major European city, second-tier or first-tier. Um, next, next to Marvin is uh, Isha Jaj Aluwalia, who I've known for many years, um, who um, is head of ICRIA, the Indian Council for Research into international economic um, uh, affairs, and uh, who is a great authority on many things Indian and beyond, including urbanization. And you've written a book about the challenge of urbanization um, in India, and so we'd love to get into that a little bit too. Next to Isha is Josias van Art Artsen, who is uh, the acting mayor of Amsterdam, uh, former elected mayor of The Hague for eight, nine years, I believe, a figure of Dutch national politics, European politics, so of all levels of government. Um, Helene Gale, um, uh, penultimately, is um, former head of CARE, which I think is the largest humanitarian organization, one or of one the, of them. One of the, yeah. Um, <laughs> former, formerly at the um, of the Center for Disease um, in, in Atlanta, um, now head of the Chicago Community Trust here in uh, in Chicago. And finally, Michael Berkowitz, who's head of 100 Resilient Cities um, of the Rockefeller Foundation. You were, I believe, head of global uh, risk operations at Deutsche Bank. And before that, uh, New York Emergency Response. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, or add to this, West Nile virus, 9-11, flight, uh, flight 111, uh, anthrax. So you're aware of the importance of resilience. Let me start um, with you, Helene. Uh, because we're here in Chicago, you're based in Chicago, we're in the loop, we're in downtown, thriving urban Chicago, uh, and yet just a few miles away on the south side and the west, west side, you've got people with life expectancy 13 years lower, hmm. 13 years lower. Actually 16. 16 years lower, 16 years lower, my goodness, um, than, than the average with it within the loop in downtown and northern, northern Chicago. Is it possible to have a vibrant city without racial integration? Yeah, well, um, thanks. And um, I will reiterate that what you started with, that Chicago is a great city. And I came here about eight months ago because I believe it's an incredible city and that it has incredible potential um, as a city. But I, to your point, I think its full potential is not being realized because of these huge inequalities and these huge gaps. You know, and I think that it, when you look at it, and we just um, supported a study that came out from the Metropolitan uh, Planning Council here that looked at the impact that segregation has had on this city. And Chicago, like many urban cities, have a longstanding history of racial uh, seg and ethnic segregation. But Chicago has had a particular history um, that has been deep and entrenched. And as a result of that, we see huge inequities. You mentioned the health inequity and the fact that here in this gleaming downtown loop area, um, the life expectancy is 85. But you go to uh, parts of west and south side of Chicago, life expectancy is, on, is 69 um, under 70. And so, you know, huge, huge gap. If you look at education, educational attainment, unemployment, uh, you can go on and on and on. And the study that I mentioned um, you know, demonstrated, or at least anal the analysis suggests that with less segregation in the city, the economic growth uh, would be um, incredibly, in, would be much higher, uh, up to $4 billion more in um, the, the, uh, the national um, city, uh, the, the, the city, city income. Uh, production the decrease in homicide by 30%, and again, on and on and on. And so I think some of these factors um, are holding the city back from realizing its full potential, even in this incredible city that continues to have economic growth, but is growing at a much slower pace than it would otherwise. In a very lopsided way. I mean, just quickly, I mean, if this was Singapore <clears throat> and Lee Kuan Yew were in charge, and it weren't really a, a, a democracy, you could sort of enforce mixed sort of mixed areas. You could mix people up. That's not possible in a democracy. It's not possible in this system. What are the solutions? How yeah, well, and, and uh, you know, it, it is not necessarily mixing people up. It is giving communities the no. ability to realize their potential. Um, and yes, you know, m uh, mixing, if you will, might have an impact. But I think it's really looking at what are some of the systemic barriers, what are the systematic barriers that hold people back, that don't allow people to have access to high quality education, access to um, high quality jobs that lead to a, a long term employment pathway, um, access to safe communities. Um, transportation that allows people to get to those jobs. So I think, yeah, you know, it's really looking at what are some of these barriers and how do you actually help to overcome those. Uh, and I want to get back to, to how you overcome those in a moment. Marvin, uh, you're um, benefiting from the perhaps sort of dubious um, glow in Bristol of being essentially an extension of the London property market. And you are <laughs> one of the fastest gentrifying, that very lo loaded word, gentrifying cities in Britain, I believe, um, which means your property prices are galloping. T t talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be mayor um, a a of a city that is experiencing this, because clearly it's, it's a, a, a sign of success, but it, uh, gentrification is not an unmixed blessing, is it? No, and it's, it's when uh, um, we heard earlier on um, in, our, in our session, it's just about that. Uh, people can be excluded from the economy, 
and excluded from jobs. I mean, I'd make the distinction between integration and inclusion, actually. Right. I, um, as I'm a mixed race man, I'm all for racial integration, but that's not the aim. <laughs> the aim is inclusion. Um, and then we build relationships from positions of equality, not uh, because we do some cultural, um, have some cultural curiosity. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a massive challenge uh, for my city. And um, one of the things that we point out is that, again, even when developers want to come in and, and build homes and have, a very, have no affordable in that unit, that's not a neutral act. That costs the city money because we end up spending money on public services to cope with the consequences of concentrations of poverty and deprivation, kids being moved from schools, families being moved around, unsettled communities, which are re uh, communities of low resilience. We spend money dealing with the consequences of that. So uh, it, it really puts housing and, and, um, and stable, balanced communities at the heart of our, our policy approach um, to the city. So just as um, you, you, in, um, in the, the Netherlands, you used to be, until not that long ago, almost a poster child of multicultural success. And things have gone a little bit wrong there, as they have in most places <laughs> in the last few years. Um, whether we're talking about inclusion or integration, what could the Dutch be doing better on, and what, others sh what should others be doing better about bringing people into the cities that they've moved to? Well, I think it's exactly what Marvin says. It is about inclusion. And in fact, it's not my favorite subject, but we didn't manage it in the right way when we got a lot, lots from Morocco and Turkey in the 60s and 70s, the Netherlands thought, well, they will stay for a short period and then they will go back to their, to their countries. And we are a tolerant country and a libertarian country, so they, they can speak their own language, they, they have their own culture, but that was in fact a mistake. They stayed and uh, Nowadays, even in the third generation, you can get people from Turkish or Moroccan or whatever descent not speaking the language. And one of the mistakes we made is not learning them obligatory the language. We, we thought, no, that's not necessary. And, uh, well, that, that led to enormous problems nowadays as well. And I'm I said it this morning during the interesting discussion we had on the leadership of, of Evo. I admire the, uh, Germany enormously because there you have to learn if you're coming to the country, and they had a lot over the periods of 15, 16, they had to learn the language. In the Netherlands, it's still the case, and that, that, that's the national government who said that, that that will be our policy. Still the case that you have to pay for your language courses yourself and uh, then, then, then need a loan and you have to pay it back after you're, well, you're more or less integrated or included in, in society. And that's the wrong policy in my view. So the cities in the Netherlands, The Hague, Amsterdam, well, they, they are the ones who now try to educate those who don't really know the language. Mm. And of course, in the end, it's important that they have jobs and etc. So we have a fascinating house of skills in in Amsterdam, where people who who, who, well, who more or less learn the language, but who you tr you try to give them uh, learning practice in in practical jobs. So you see, Germany is uh, is, is a little bit of a model in the, in, the, in that regard. Uh, Isha. I mean, there are plenty of social exclusions in India, and I know that you know caste doesn't disappear when people leave the village and go to the city, but you can't go to any Indian city without seeing the extraordinary glaring sort of economic mismatch. And I, I mean, I think of one example, seeing that the home of Mukesh Ambani, um, <laughs> India's richest man, head of Reliance <laughs> in Mumbai, you know, with five helipads, underground parking for 600 guests. <laughs> A few miles away, you have Dharavi, what was then Asia's largest slum. This kind of disparity um, doesn't seem to be being addressed with any kind of urgency. And I know there's been political backlashes. You had the Ahmadmi Party, the Common Man Party, emerge from nowhere, knock the BJP out, knock Congress out, and take power in Delhi. But you don't really see any sort of sustainable um, efforts to bridge these gaps in India. Am I wrong? Am I being too cynical? 
No, I think you are right. And inequality has increased, although we don't have firm numbers about that. I'm quite happy to admit that, yes, inequality has increased. But what is different is that because India has, for the first time, seen very rapid growth for about 20 years, we have got a whole lot of people rise out of poverty and come into the middle class. So our uh, focus for a long time was on abolishing <coughs> poverty. And as growth happened in the process, some people became very rich. Many people were lifted out of poverty. And what is most important for inclusion today are two things. One is that aspirations are rising faster than incomes. And therefore, some of this sensitivity that why can't we get out there and get jobs? And the second problem with respect to inclusion is that growth has not been employment generating. So when people come from rural areas to urban areas, they come with expectations of getting jobs in high productivity, industry or services sector. Those jobs have not been there, not in adequate uh, uh, amounts. And as a result, you have that insecurity, that restlessness, which you see in our cities. And as the population of cities increases, even though even today, India has just about 35 or 36 percent of our population that is urban, which is very low mm. compared to most other countries. But we are not able to handle public service delivery in our cities even for this bit of increase. So the need for planned urbanization mm. is very, very urgent. And I, and I want to get into a little bit later what Narendra Modi, your prime minister, means by smart mm. cities, <laughs> when he's talking about building 100 smart cities. Um, but, but Michael, I mean, you're, you're the sort of urban expert, the sort of generalist here. Pull, pull, pull some of this together. We're sure. talking about very diverse cities in yeah. different continents with very different problems. Yeah. But all of them have the same generic problem of having a gap to mind, a pretty big gap to mind, whether that be social, economic, usually both. Yeah. Um, what is it that, which cities are doing this well that can be um, picked up and applied to cities in very different contexts? Which are the cities you, you see as, and please don't mention Singapore because everybody's bored <laughs> of hearing about <laughs> Singapore. Okay. Other than Singapore. Other than Singapore. Um, um, so, I, I mean, I think just to, just to level set a little bit, the reason why y you have someone who is involved in something called 100 Resilient Cities on this panel is that when we talk about resilience, we talk about a city's ability to survive disaster. Um, and that is a capacity that many people associate with infrastructure, but is really also about good governance. It's about how cities help meet basic needs of their citizens. It's about community cohesion where neighbors check on neighbors, and it's about equity and inclusion. Um, all of those give cities the ability to survive and thrive in the face of whatever the disaster is, whether it's a climate disaster or something else. And if you think about uh, you know, New Orleans and the Katrina story, it, that story is as much about how warm the Gulf of Mexico was, how big the storm Katrina was, how the infrastructure failed, but it was also about the isolation and desperation in the Lower Ninth Ward it was about endemic racism. It was about uh, lack of opportunity. Uh, and it was about corrupt institutions. All of that contributed as much to the misery post-Katrina as the storm did itself. It's not a rhetorical device to say that these two things, say climate risk and equity, are inextricably linked. Um, and so that's really a part of the risk profile. And then to bring it all together, I think to, just responding a little bit to what we've heard so far, you know, you talk about isolation. Uh, and not being able to mix people forcibly like a housing policy in Singapore might mm -hmm. have done. But you can also create, through the built environment and through the programs that Helene talked about, the, the ways in which they can mix. And I, I would actually say the Dutch are doing it quite well. The Dutch have been recognized as experts in water policy and water management and building infrastructure. But lots of Dutch water management infrastructure these days has social infrastructure components. It's dikes and levees that have parks. It's water plazas in the heart of some of the most vulnerable areas 
that can capture additional rainwater runoff, but then serve as five-a-side football pitch and a community theater and all these things. It's how cities actually integrate these interventions. You know, we're going to spend uh, two trillion a year building urban infrastructure for the next 25, 30 years. We better make it work for equity as much as it works for mobility or climate change or whatever those things are. Uh, so let's talk about something more specific: property prices. Um, you know, I don't think there's any better expression of um, the gap between those with means and those without means in any city, whether we're talking about Delhi, Amsterdam, Bristol, uh, Chicago, or New York, uh, than between uh, the, than the value of property prices. And it's not just the high-end local property prices. It's the fact that you've got global sovereign wealth funds and you've got big hedge funds like BlackRock put pouring more and more money into high-end property portfolios so that those property prices begin to track global asset prices rather than local economic conditions. So, um, Marvin, you are, as I say, in property terms in Bristol, pretty much sort of experiencing London or close to London prices um, nowadays. Uh, how, as a mayor, can you, what practical things can you do to sort of overcome some of that sky-high unaffordability that a lot of people are, uh, are experiencing? Well, I mean, there is, there is something about the framing of housing, actually, that, that we could look at, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But in the, in the UK, we think health is a public good that should be accessible to anyone, free at the point of delivery. We think of the same with education. Maybe there's time to think about housing in terms of that, not a commodity to be bought and sold, but actually as, as an essential public good that must be supplied, because if we get it wrong, nothing else works. Education doesn't work. Population health doesn't work. Um, society is fragile. So maybe there's a, a reframing of that. And in, in the UK, as you'll know, houses are now pensions because pensions ain't working. So it's, it's in some sense, product and driver of, 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 a, of a wider social dysfunction. But I, I, in my city, there's um, some very basic needs. We haven't built enough houses in, since the 80s. Uh, a lot of the public housing stock got sold off. We didn't build them. So um, I've given a... One of my um, cabinet members, his job is just to build houses. That is it. Don't think about anything else. Just get houses built. And we've set some very hard targets. Uh, we've, we, we, we are quite large landowners in, in Bristol. The, the local government owns a lot of land, which has been undeveloped, ironically. Um, but now we are inviting people and just making that declaration that we want to get houses built and we have some hard targets has meant that developers have come forward to start looking at trying to build on our land. But we've been clear on the percentage of affordable. We have a target of 40%. To be honest, we don't reach that. We go for 20 quite often as well. Um, but what we're also clear on is because we are such large landowners, and I've said this to some developers, if you come into my city and you want to build on, on our land, I'm going to look at your record. I'm going to look at what you do on the land over which we have no control. And if you don't have a track record of delivering affordable, then Bristol, which is a very attractive city for developers, you'll get one hit. But if you want to go on a 10-year journey with us in a fantastic city to develop in, then deliver, and the reward will be a 10-year journey. But we're looking at other models as well. So we've got um, uh, a, a, a social, social developers coming forward. We've got self-builds coming forward. So we're looking at the whole mix. And we're also looking at the way we allocate housing, so public housing. It used to be the way you get a public house is turn up at local government and tell everyone how crap your life is, and then you get a house. One is it's not a good relationship to have with someone. It's, an, it's a deficit model of development and running a place rather than an asset model. But what we want to do is be very intentional about how we allocate housing. Actually, so we build the kind of communities that Michael's talks about. Balanced communities, mixed communities, not with concentrations of deprivation in some areas and concentrations of wealth in others. So we get very intentional about the way we put a place together without going too much Singapore on you, but, <laughs> but, but, having, a, but having a firm idea with a sense of the financial benefits that brings to the city of actually um, delivering on that. But I've only been elected two years, so I'm not saying we've got all the answers. We just have a sense of what we need to, need to be pursuing. Um, each other, in a minute, I'm just going to um, and bring you in, but I just quickly want to ask you, Michael, you know, without having, and particularly in New York and London, but without having um, beneficial ownership declared so that you can the ultimate, know who the ultimate owner of a property is, um, without having um, a very different non-domicile situation, um, 
are you going to be able to tackle this problem? Yeah, I think uh, the national environments in which these cities are operating. We're going to spend the next three days talking about how cities are this great incubator and experimenter and, and, and exporter of best practice and how they learn from each other and how cities are more and more important and maybe national governments are less important. But in this area, a lot of this is often national level policy. Um, and so uh, that's where you see uh, this conflicting uh, with, with national level policy. And, and cities are really struggling to understand how they improve themselves in an environment like the US and not suffer the consequences of gentrification. I think that is, I mean, they have some levers around policy, around rent control. Some cities are, exper are experimenting with something, co tax, tax caps, right? Um, experiment, experimenting with community um, housing subsidies for workers like firemen, policemen, teachers, and so on to try to retain that middle class. But uh, we haven't, we've also seen, you know, a lot of communities really afraid of what happens when you improve those communities. There's an interesting story about the cleanup of the Anacostia uh, in, where Washington. The, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. of the Anacostia River, which is polluted, which is a ma major flood risk, which will deteriorate over time with climate change. And yet the local communities who have the most to gain from it are fearful because they're afraid it will lead to gentrification. Yeah, I mean, imagine that is a problem you would like to have in <coughs> India. Um, I mean, that's further down the line. The Yamuna <laughs> needs cleaning up, too. Um, what, what is the smart city solution to all of this, to affordable housing for the common, for the common um, citizen? Well, first of all, nobody really knows exactly what is meant by a smart city. <laughs> so let me share a definition of smart city that I extracted out of the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, the <laughs> smartest city in the world. In an audience like a this, a hall full of people, when he was complimenting the government of India on the smart cities mission three years ago, and he said India should have not 100 smart cities, but 1,000 smart cities, and I said to him, pray, what is your understanding of a smart city? And this is what he said. He said, when the people of a city, when the residents of a city demand better public services, and the government, with the help of administrative reform and technology, delivers these services in a transparent and accountable manner, to me, that is a smart city. Now, our smart cities mission uh, that we have actually depends on technology to deliver smart solutions. And it has not really paid enough attention to the need to reform the institutions in which that technology is going to be located. Um, let me just give you one example of what I consider a smart city in India. And that is a city probably none of you would have heard of. It's a city called Magarpatta, which is outside of Pune. Pune is the second largest city of Maharashtra. Magarpatta was developed by 120 farming families that came together to form a development company in 1993 when they learned that land use was going to change and urbanization was going to come to their place. It's 400 acres, and today it is the smartest city of all in India. It's a green city. It manages all its solid waste in the right way, the only city to do that. It has its wastewater treatment. It has green spaces, as you would like. It has unpolluted air. Magar Patta, you Magar can look Patta. up the net. Magar Patta, I've, I've, I've memorized it. It comes before Singapore in my memory now. Um, and it's also a startup city, not just a smart city. Yes, um, yes. Now, the, one of the problems cities face, and I'm, I'm going to get onto the sort of bigger politics, but one of the problems that they face is they're not getting much help from national governments. So you've got, um, and I want both of you to talk about this, but Helene, first, you. Um, You've got all these federal departments like HUD in Washington, the Housing and Urban Development Department, headed by people who don't believe in their mission. 
Um, what, what, what kind of a prob challenge is that posing for places like Chicago and the kind of work that you do? Well, you know, um, because we're a private entity, uh, we're not dependent, and we're a philanthropy, so we're not dependent on government funding per se, but clearly to be able to do a lot of the things that, that we would want to do, government cooperation is incredibly important. Um, you know, I do think to the theme of this whole conference, it's why I think that focusing on what cities can do is incredibly important because I think there are times where we may not have the kind of support, um, both financial as well as policy, from the national level to be able to get some of the things done. And that's where I think um, innovation at the that the municipal level is so important. But I also think it's a time when we start thinking about how do you bring not just government sector, but the private sector, the um, not-for-profit sector, philanthropic sector together to find solutions. Because I think this is a time where we're gonna start finding these kinds of partnerships across sectors that uh, we might not have done when we're reliant, when we could rely on um, federal funding, federal policies. So I think there's real opportunity for innovation in how we do the kinds of social change that needs to happen. Okay, and uh, hopefully we'll get back a little bit more uh, um, in questions into that theme. Um, yes, uh, your and, and I, but I will just say, and while you know it may be hard during this time, I, I like your the notion when you talked about smart cities that part of this is also about how citizens hold their governments accountable. Mm -hmm. And I also think this is a time where we need to think about how are we making sure that that we're saying what is most important for us as citizens as well. Uh, now, I mean, Holland's kind of different. To, to, to the United States or to India, you're, you're compact and you're highly urbanized, so maybe you don't have quite the same divide um, between national government outlooks and urban governance, but you've, you've worn both hats, you've, and you've been in the European Commission as well, you've been at multiple layers of government. What, what do you think that is lacking in terms of how cities use national governments and what national governments can do to help cities overcome the kinds of problems we're discussing here? For, uh, for Dutch, Dutch cities um, is that we hardly have uh, our own tax system. Uh, income tax for cities in the Netherlands is about six or seven or sometimes eight percent of the income of cities and the way they can spend their money and the rest comes from the central government or some, at some, for some sectors from the provincial government. And, and if you look at Europe, well, the average is more or less 35 or 30 percent for cities who can earn their own income by, uh, by leveling taxes. So that, that's a problem for, uh, for, Dutch, uh, for Dutch cities. And uh, we, for a long time already, we, we plea in the, in the direction of the national government that that should, should change without uh, the, the risk of higher uh, income tax, and, uh, because that's always a difficult problem, so we have to balance taxes. Uh, and the strange thing, of course, is, I, I think Ivo Dalda mentioned it, uh, the Dutch Republic in the, in the, in the golden age of, uh, of the Netherlands was built on cities, and uh, that has changed we have since the beginning of the 19th century a central, more, more or less decentralized, but a central government which is quite strong. And I think we are now on the, on, the, on the edge of changing that. And I think we should do that. And that will be an, an interesting discussion in the Netherlands between the national government and especially the larger cities. You were, of course, part of the Hanseatic League. Let me, because I know I'm, I'm getting sort of violent hand signals off the hedge about timing, so I want to squeeze a, a question. Um, uh, they're probably not, I'm being really unfair. Um, I want to squeeze a question in about the larger politics of this. You know, if you think of uh, any nation state um, and its political culture, when they talk about what their real country is, they always have, and of course the word real is highly contestable, but they always have a rural image. You know, when you have the Gandhian, village and the homespun cotton as being the idea of India. In Britain, it's you know, some home county's village with thatched cottages and 
Frisian cows. Um, I'm sure there's some windmills in your vision. And in America, there are cornfields <laughs> and small towns. Um, cities are, you know, increasingly, as I said at the beginning, being vetoed in terms of their political preference for national governments by people who don't live in them. What can cities do to be more loved in the national imagination um, and therefore to have more leverage over the national <laughs> direction? Um, and, you know, this is a very open-ended question, but I think it, it's not a frivolous one. I think it's a, it's a pretty important question facing all cities, and, and, and the same applies to India. Um, let, let's just go around each view, and then, because of the non-violent, very gentle hand signals, we will then move quickly to audience questions. <laughs> Michael. I, I think the, the reality is, is that cities will never have enough... They never c will control their own destiny. And so they will always need to work in coalition using formal power and soft power and build coalitions, whether that's with the suburbs or with private sector or civil society, as Helene mentioned, or with you know, the exurbs beyond. That, that is, those are all the elements. You think about New York, as, as, as I was saying earlier, 90 billion annual budget, controls their own water from the, the, the reservoir to the tap, their own schools, 250,000 employees, and yet, doesn't, many of the factors that make New York livable, equitable, sustainable, resilient are beyond the mayor's control. And so what can cities do to ingratiate themselves? They can work more collaboratively with their neighbors, whether those are surrounding right. counties or states or, or, or beyond. So how does Chicago seduce <laughs> Illinois? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think first of all, um, it's, it's starting to break down some of our urban rural silos and actually get to know each other and, and what are people <laughs> living with. And I, you know, I think that as you mentioned in uh, several of the political scenarios, uh, they evolved because people were out of touch with what was going on in the middle of their countries. And so I think that we can all do a lot more to get to understand what the issues are. And then think about where are there um, opportunities for uh, working in, in more complementary and um, coordinated fashions and in ways that there's some mutual win-wins. Clearly in this region, um, it is important for Chicago to, be, to see itself as part of the broader region. Um, there's a lot of industry, there's a lot of agriculture, there's a lot of economic growth that happens outside of the city of Chicago. And I think by being better about figuring out how to integrate the region, economic growth and all that can come with that um, will be much greater than only thinking about what's in the, in the bounds of the metropolitan area. So I think there's a lot of ad advantage in thinking about how do we actually look at some of those win-win situations and break down some of those silos. Interesting. Um, what about the Netherlands? Difficult question. Uh, there is some tendency in the Netherlands, uh, that's not a lucky uh, tendency, to be quite critical about the cities, especially Amsterdam, <laughs> uh, because many in the, in, in the Netherlands think it's a strange city, libertarian city, and uh, they're spending a lot of money. Uh, so there is a tendency to be quite critical, not really helpful. We have a big discussion at the moment for the police force and the capacity, more capacity for the police force, important for security uh, in, in the city of Amsterdam. And it's quite difficult to, to get a real ear that listens to you. Uh, maybe the best thing in the Netherlands to change our electoral system. <laughs> Uh, Isha, whatever you say about Modi, he is actually a pro-urban prime minister, right? In the way in which he talks, mm -hmm. and in the way in which he has uh, put out some uh, campaigns for the urban areas, but in fact, the, if you look at the uh, uh, politics of the situation, India is essentially a two-tier federal setup. And cities are the creatures of the state government. If the census says that between two 10-year uh, census outcomes, you have had 2,700 areas that should be declared as towns, actually, 
only 250 were declared between 2001 and 2011, and the other 2,500 were orphaned towns, which do not have a city government. And if you talk to chief ministers, they will say that these guys don't want to become cities because there is more money in being rural, mm. because a whole lot of central programs are right. there. And second, if they were to become city governments, there'll be more regulation from the center and the state government, mm. so they don't want to be cities. The idea of Britain <laughs> doesn't seem to have kept up with the pace of urbanization. How do you crack this and be relatively efficient, because I'm, I've been yeah. inefficient with time here. So you, um, if you could compress your answer. Yeah, I, I think the world's moved on and the model of governance we have, both nationally and internationally, is not kept pace with the way people are today. I'm, I'm a global, I'm a British, I'm Bristolian. My family are Jamaicans as well, right? The Jamaicans that come and live here, they are Swiss, you know. We, we are a global family and governance needs to catch up with that. I mean, if, on the point that you made though about how do we court, if, if I heard it right, how do we court people around us, part of me thinks, I'm not interested in courting them. It's nice if they come along, um, but actually I can't wait for the rural areas of, of, of the UK to catch up with where cities need to be. There's this line by Martin Luther King that talks about power. It says power doesn't come neatly wrapped in government parcels. It's a social force that's there when you get organized. Mm -hmm. And so there's a piece of me that says whatever national governments think, and I'm privileged, I'm in the UK, so it's safe for me to say that I'm not gonna get arrested. But whatever national governments think, whatever other governments think, actually, just as a collection of cities, not just within the nation, but globally, we just need to be better organized and better connected. And if we do, we will exercise that influence. And just very briefly, we, so in the two years that since we voted Brexit, not once has David Davis, our Brexit secretary, come to the core cities, the 10 biggest cities outside London, and said, what do you need from the negotiations? Which is remarkable, right? So what's he negotiating? So in February this year, the 10 core cities went to meet Michel Barnier ourselves. No government sanction, we just went to meet him to say, well, what could we do? And that's the lines we need to pursue. Whatever our national governments are saying, we need to work as international networks, saying how can we work together for our own interest, particularly where our populations cross our city boundaries. Um, th there's time literally for one very quick question. Um, and um, uh, I can't see anybody because he's like... <laughs> <laughs> So if, if, um, if somebody could flash a torch at me three times. <laughs> uh, can I see? Ah. Um, do I see a hand? Um, there's one hand here. I think a mic is um, just away the mic. And then I, a short, sharp question, yes. if you will. I come from Colombia, from a developing country. And I think that there's a very interesting discussion here. You have said we need to put cities in the center of national um, agendas. We need to put also cities in the international agenda. The World Bank, the IDB. It the, is a question. The question is, yeah. we, please, if you could let us know, how can we put cities in the, in the international agenda? That would be the question. Michael? Uh, well, I, I think um, he's right that the global institutions have largely been set up to deal with sovereign governments, and uh, there are some efforts afoot to try to change that. And I think those institutions are changing, but they're big, um, uh, unwieldy institutions that don't change easily. And so the IDB, uh, which uh, oversees the Inter-American Development Bank, which oversees Latin America, uh, a, a highly urbanized region is much better at dealing with cities, uh, in Colombian cities and others, uh, than the World Bank is, uh, which has a much more sovereign uh, focus. Uh, so I, I think th these are changing, uh, but we will still, we're never going to go back to Florence versus Siena, right? I mean, w w national governments are still going to be an important part of uh, what uh, makes up this landscape. And so how do we integrate? Uh, I mean, I respectfully disagree with M Marvin a little bit in terms of you can't just uh, go it alone. Ultimately, you're going to have to bring the national government along. I know that's not what you meant, but it, it, you know, we are going to have to find that balance between urban uh, and rural and, and, and take it from there. 
I also think that, you know, um, these institutions that have existed, um, while I think they still have a role, I'm not sure that they're serving their role as uh, true international governance like they may have before. And I think that there are new sources and new ways of creating um, power networks that I think cities can really be at the um, core of. And so I think, you know, things like this uh, that are bringing people together, I think are going to start creating new kinds of institutions that really do put cities in the center. And I think with all the different networks and uh, information channels and all the rest of it, I think that we're gonna find new ways of having kind of global governance that really does look at cities as a very important part of that. We have run out of time. Um, I think of this as an hors d'oeuvre uh, you know, to, to a larger meal of the op opening and we'll continue. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, and, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. I do want to, uh, I want to thank the Financial Times and the Council for hosting uh, this conference. Uh, we've done it a number of years. I think it's three years in a row. I know from the Mayor's perspective how important this is for not only sharing ideas, and best practices, the common problems. I do want to say my own perspective is why this is also important for the city of Chicago, but also uh, major uh, world's global cities. I think there's 100 cities around the globe that run the economic, cultural, intellectual energy of the world economy. Just to give you a perspective, the Chicago area is the 21st largest economy in the world. It has over 200 plus cultural institutions, more universities than any other city in the United States but Boston. It is a driving intellectual, economic, and cultural force in the global economy. And I think we're actually witnessing a time, an inflection point, where national governments are stepping back from their role, and therefore cities must step into that void, whether it's on climate change, immigration, housing policies, affordability, to find policies that we can work on together, not just as cities, but all the issues that cities face today from education, quality of life, environmental quality, actually build coalitions with our surrounding areas so we become a bigger, stronger political force to help solve those problems. I think this is an important discussion. I always look forward to it. I know my colleagues do uh, from around the world to actually understand, learn from each other, and more importantly, then take away and make these ideas. I'm already working on an idea from another mayor about something we discussed today on affordable housing as I prepare our own plan for the city of Chicago on affordability. I wanna thank everybody for participating uh, and for kicking off, I think, in a really important uh, program again for the city of Chicago and to the Financial Times and the council and all of you for thinking about the future and starting to actually wire that future. Thank you. <laughs>